And welcome. We're excited to have Moon Lake Lee from Unlocking ADHD Singapore and Henry Shelford from ADHD UK. Welcome, Henry and Moon Lake. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Welcome. Um, Moon Lake, I understand you've got a couple of slides to share with us in and around what Unlocking ADHD Singapore are doing at the minute. Sure, uh, that'd be great. I figure sometimes picture paints a thousand words, so I'll just share what we're doing first and then we can chat about it. Um, so I you know, hope you can see my slides. Okay, uh, yeah. we're going to share about what we've been doing in Singapore and you know the situation may or may not be different from you know, where you guys are. But uh, in terms of Singapore, um, about 3% of adults um, are impacted by ADHD. And you know, the problem statement that we identified is that ADHD impairs relationships causing work underperformance, also for school and for life leading to lost potential. So that's what we're trying to address in Singapore. And the fact that, you know, there's so many other issues with ADHD that a lot of people are not aware of. And that's where we're doing the advocacy. So in terms of unlocking ADHD itself, actually October, we turned two years old. So we're really a baby. Um, you know, we just received our charity status in Singapore earlier this year and also membership as a social service agency. Uh, very much uh, appreciated and hard fought because in Singapore, you have to be in existence two years before you can apply for membership as a social service agency. So we were very grateful that we were fast tracked, you know, because of the gap in the services in the space that we are working in. And we are ADHD driven. We're an inclusive employer about 50% of our board of directors have ADHD or are parents of children with ADHD. And our mission really is to empower ADHDers and their families to live life to the fullest. And uh, we're hoping to address the problems I mentioned earlier through our four pillars of awareness, accessibility, access to mental health professionals familiar with ADHD, um, access in terms of uh, the uh, you know support group systems that are needed, as well as uh, tools to manage day-to-day -day, uh, to make life better and in terms of achievement we're always focusing on the incremental change you know they all build up and lead to you know the bigger change yeah. and then in terms of advocacy it's really in terms of the um in terms of you know like a, what can people do to advocate for themselves in terms of knowing what their strengths and weaknesses are and also in terms of advocacy you know, in terms of general society so uh, you know how we're actually you know having a model of services and support is really what we call you know, the step care approach um, through our three E's, Enlighten, Enrich, Enable. Enlighten really is to do with ADHD literacy, uh, awareness about ADHD, whether it's through schools, corporations, parent groups. Uh, Enrich is really the peer-to-peer -peer support that we're trying to grow in Singapore. And right now, um, we have different communities um, from the low-touch kind of masses, like say our Facebook virtual support group and our Discord server. But now we're growing the physical, the smaller groups. Uh, and we're starting right now in the collaboration to test a pilot for uh, youth ADHD support groups. And then in terms of the enable part, it's more of the equipping. So we're looking at workshops and coaching, particularly group coaching for ADHD. Um, and uh, what we're really excited about as well, which we'll formally launch next month during ADHD Awareness Month, is uh, we've come up with our own ADHD starter kit. We call it Restart for adults. And you can look at the picture there, you know, it's origami, you know, lots of like mistakes, crumpling it up, and then finally you find what you need. Um, and, you know, we're opening up things like um, self-assessments so that people can, you know, check out whether they may have ADHD first. And if they do score pretty high, they can take it to see the psychiatrist. And that helps to give the framework, you know, to have a very productive conversation about diagnosis. And, you know, our starter kit is free for download. And it's a lot of ro local resources. And in the past two years, uh, you know, our website was built uh, all through the help of volunteers, ground up, uh, got it up and running in seven weeks. Um, and within four months, the National Library Board in Singapore actually wrote to us and said, can we archive your website as something, you know, quite significant for Singapore? So we're really happy about that. And then last year, I had a crazy shower idea to actually have a microsite in the official languages. So we have the microsites in Mandarin, Tamil and Malay. And we launched that um, with a YouTube a webinar in those languages featuring a psychiatrist or psychologist, a parent and a youth or an adult ADHD. -er. So we really wanted to make it 360 degrees. Um, the way we work is we partner with mental health professionals and we combine it with the lived experience. So they really are both sides of the coin so that people get a more comprehensive view. Um, back when we first started in 2021, uh, we worked with our regional broadcaster, CNA, and we did a, a documentary on women with ADHD. 
So there were three women, myself included, who shared about our journeys. And we weren't the typical phase of ADHD. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I was diagnosed when I was 50, you know, and I had a very varied career, four degrees, so not typical. I had another lady on the, the documentary who was a vet, you know, with ADHD, and also one more lady who was pursuing her PhD at that time. So not typical, but, you know, since it was first um, broadcast, um, over 235,000 views on YouTube, but it's not so much the eyeballs, but the fact that a lot of people actually went for a diagnosis. So to me, it was pretty much life transforming. So we do try to work with the media a lot because we can see the power of um, the media to share stories and to change lives. Um, more recently, uh, two weeks ago, we were featured again on the regional broadcaster. Um, a little bit of my love story, but also you know the journey um, founding Unlocking ADHD in Singapore and, and how uh, my husband supports me in that. Um, so now we're going to the physical events post-COVID. So we're doing fireside chats where the community comes and, you know, sort of like a fly on the wall for conversations. And um, again, we are trying to make uh, testing for ADHD more accessible to people in Singapore. We have a YouTube library of resources, all from the different webinars we have done in the last two years on a variety of topics from marriages to school, parenting, medication and so on. And uh, again, that's our website. We have a lot of local faces, local stories. We did our first annual report, so it's there. Um, and we've also been trying to engage with the different government ministries, uh, stakeholder engagement, so that they have a better understanding about ADHD and how is a multi-ministry lifespan approach that's needed. So next month, we'll have the first ever ADHD Awareness Day in Singapore, and uh, it's gonna be a stakeholder engagement event. So uh, pretty much, uh, a whirlwind tour of the last two years. And uh, yeah, just open to any questions that you have. Fantastic. Well, thank you, because I know that uh, I, I get the I get the first question after the after the slides. Like, it's wonderful what you're doing. It's really exciting. And it's one, it's also wonderful having, you know, three ADHD charities here together, Australia, uh, unlocking ADHD in Singapore, ADHD UK, and uh, I think the strength of us learning from each other and um, taking the best from each other is, is just wonderful. So it's great everyone being here, all being part of the conference. So I just thank wanted you. to say, thank you for the opportunity to share. Well, well, thank you for being part of it. I just wanted to celebrate celebrate that. Um, you talked a little bit, uh, uh, and I think we've talked in, in the past about your personal diagnosis story. So you know, getting, getting diagnosed at, uh, at 50. Like, could, could you share more about your story? Uh, sure. Well, you know, in our community, a lot of parents are diagnosed after their children. So we always talk about the, the genetic link. Uh, and I was diagnosed a year after my child. Uh, she was diagnosed at 15 and I was diagnosed at 50. And, you know, at a certain point in your life, you always think, you know, what's, you know, you don't need to get diagnosed, even if you suspect, you know, that you might have ADHD because... I'm not in school anymore, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I was really struggling whether I should do something about it. But I'm the kind of person that tends to bite off more than they can chew. So I'm always dealing with overcommitment. And I think at that point in my life, it was just too many things going on and I felt the overwhelm. And I was thinking, you know, if there was a way to get more clarity, to prioritize or even squeeze extra minutes in a day, you know, to get things done. Um, and I was hoping maybe a diagnosis would help me with that. So that's why I went for a diagnosis. But the interesting thing is that didn't change too much. But what changed post-diagnosis was actually my relationship with my husband. That was quite unexpected. Um, I've been married just past 30 years now. Um, and I, I think that that was a significant change for me. And the other thing that was quite significant was um, just the self-acceptance, uh, you know, the context about my past, right? Uh, that I never really processed. So, so I think to me, it's quite liberating. Yeah, thank you. What a wonderful story. And I think um, the name of just around unlocking ADHD and what that means in Singapore, you've described of truly a, a story that unlocks, um, as you've mentioned, you know, just from about your past. Is that how you came up with, you know, the organisation and, and its premise? I think, if, I don't know whether you guys can see the logo behind me clearly, but there's a story behind that, okay? And you can see that it's a, a stylized brain, okay? And um, if you notice, there's a yellow part there. And, and we color it yellow because we want to call attention to it, but we also color it yellow because yellow is a color of hope. That part is the prefrontal cortex. So we believe that actually the executive function is one of the ways that we can unlock potential, 
for those with ADHD. Um, and the orange, of course, is a, you know, is a color of energy, vibrancy, and ADHD awareness. And if you look at the lock, it's an unlock, but the top part of the lock uh, looks a bit like a question mark. It's basically to answer the questions that we have had about ourselves all these years, right? You know, like if we think we're capable, how come we don't, we're not able to show it? And the top part of the lock also looks like an earlobe, a listening ear, peer support. Support groups are so important in this journey. So that is sort of the story of our logo. But it's our DNA as well. Oh, thank you. It's not. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lovely. Yeah, it's a lovely story. Um, you talked about um, the uh, stakeholder engagement. Uh, so Singapore is very different uh, in terms of how you set up a charity, uh, and you have a lot of different hoops to go through. It'd be, I think it'd be great to tell people a bit about the stages you've got to go to, the stages you've done and where you hope to get to? Um, we're still in, in this journey. Um, I think uh, for those with ADHD, um, sometimes paperwork, uh, you know, SOPs, um, manuals are all very uh, painful for us. Okay, and definitely I think many times before I went on this journey, but I think for us, the, the biggest thing was because there wasn't that much awareness in Singapore, and we do know there's so much impact on our lives from ADHD that is uh, undiagnosed and unmanaged. So the impetus to do something that was not just for the now, but also for decades to come was there. And in terms of all the different vehicles in which you do it, uh, we came to the conclusion that having a charity was actually the most strategic way because then you are actually part of government and you can actually uh, be able to have those conversations and be be able to plan. Uh, we have something in Singapore called the master plan, you know, for the five year, 10 year master plan. And we want to be part of that. So I think we saw charity being uh, the way to do that. But to get there, we really had to make sure that in terms of uh, compliance, uh, in terms of, you know, all the governance stuff, you know, we had to check all the boxes. So we've already passed the first level, the basic charity. But the next level now that we're aiming for is something called IPC. Institution of a public character. So in Singapore, if you're an IPC, then you can give tax deductible receipt. So for many charities, this is something that they aim for because it makes fundraising a lot easier. Because at this moment, in terms of fundraising, because we can't give that receipt, um, we're only limited to um, either people in the community who really feel what we're doing and understand and want to support us, or the maybe the philanthropy organizations. But in terms of the regular person in the street, it's not as attractive to them. So that, that's where we're going. But we know that it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of compliance to get there. Thank you. I wanted to ask, um, and as Henry mentioned, you know, Singapore is different to the UK, but then also to Australia. We've noticed here in Australia that there's an increasing number of adults being diagnosed with ADHD. How are you finding that within Singapore? I think it's similar and I've noticed a trend worldwide actually and it could be because of COVID. Uh, you know, I think it changed a lot of the routines that we had um, and also because we all spent more time online, there was more time to Google and, and learn. Of course, TikTok, we heard about the explosion of searches for ADHD on TikTok. So I think it, uh, in Singapore, we also have that same kind of phenomena. Um, but there are differences and uh, one of the things that we're really um, pleased about is that you know, ever since we came on the scene, and, you know, we did some of these government engagement. There's been actually more discussions about ADHD by ministers and even recently by the president of Singapore, the former president of Singapore. So I think to us, that's something quite meaningful. And we hope to have more of these conversations to come. And what is, yeah, that's in, really interesting. What did the president, the former president of Singapore say? Well, um, in, in Singapore, every year, we have a national newspaper. It's called the Straits Times. And every year, um, there is something called a nomination for Singaporean of the Year. Oh, well, so, yeah, so I was nominated on. last year. Uh, and I was one of the finalists um, for Singaporean of the Year for the work that I'm doing in the area of ADHD. Um, I Can didn't... I Thank you. I didn't win it. That someone else was way more deserving. You know, I'm the new kid in the block. Okay, but someone else got it. Very well deserved. But I was very grateful for the opportunity because, um, you know, when the president of Singapore officiated, you know, and in her speech she talked about all the different nominees, the Straits Times co covered by stories on YouTube. So it really opened us up, not just the ADHD community like on social media, 
but mainstream. So people who didn't know we, that we existed, you know, hopefully, you know, they had that knowledge now. Um, we still have a long ways to go because, you know, we're only two. But just all these things are, to me, are very uh, big blessings in life and also make life fun, you know, and happy. Yeah. And you said you went mainstream. That's that's fantastic. But what kind of what kind of engagement were you getting from your community? What was what were some of the stories that you were receiving from your, you know, from Singapore community itself? Well, you know, one of the things that we did that was quite interesting is um, I changed psychiatrists back in August 2021. I went to see a government psychiatrist in the National University of Singapore. And the first thing he did when I walked into his office was he said, may I scan your brain? And I said, huh? You know, like, what for? And he said he was actually doing some research to see whether infrared brain scans could be used as a diagnostic tool for adult ADHD. Because you know, there were other countries like Japan where they were doing that. And he wanted to just check it out to see whether they could look at the biological side. Because we know usually it's either the psychiatrist's appointment or a lot of testing by psychologists. So I sat there and I looked at him and, and I said, do you need volunteers? And then he said, yes. And I said, oh, my goodness. You know, I believe in serendipity, right? I had a community of about 2,000 people on our private Facebook page that, you know, didn't know where to go to get a diagnosis. They couldn't afford it because I think like everywhere in the world, it can be pretty expensive in private clinics. And suddenly this professor is saying, I need subjects, you know. And then when, when you see him, um, he actually covers transportation fees, about $30 per person. So in the end, not only is it a free kind of diagnosis as part of a research subject, but you know, people at least knew where to go after that. So one of the stories is that a friend of mine you know, who has been seeing a private practice clinic for, for years, right, and, and was having some financial struggles, when she went through as a, as a volunteer and, and got her paper diagnosis again right, from this process, um, the first time she went through the subsidized route to see a doctor um, in the public hospital and get her meds, she cried because the bill was so different, the amount on the bill, you know, and, and that to me is, is, you know, excess is one of our pillars, as I mentioned earlier. So to, to me, that's excess. And so since the um, research was done, um, they're now opening it up as a service. So people can actually go and, you know, do that. And, and the doctor now has introduced an eye scanner as well. So there's an eye scanner, there's a brain scan, there's like a questionnaire, and it's also an interview with a psychiatrist, all together maybe one and a half hours. Wow. It's, yeah. it's wonderful that sort of pioneering research is happening that you've obviously, as a, as both as an individual and a charity, have, uh, have promoted it. Uh, uh, there's, there's some s similar research going on, at, uh, um, I believe, at King's, uh, King's College London, um, my understanding at the moment, which is obviously what the research is trying to under, uh, understand, is that the brain scans, um, whilst interesting, aren't diagnostic. Um, Correct. But that's where where they're trying to trying to get to. Now, I had a question. I got uh, um, uh, two young kids. So this is this is and, and remember my own school days. Um, uh, Singaporean schools are. Famously disciplinarian, <laughs> um, and um, you know, so children struggling to contain their hyperactivity, you know, their impulsivity and inattention it can be it can be tough anyway. I imagine it's even tougher in Singapore. So, what's it like being a kid with ADHD in a, in Singapore right now? And 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 add on question: What? How do you want it to change? Um, I think. It is tough. I mean, you know, I have two girls, you know, now they're 19 and 20, but they did go through the Singapore system. And, you know, there was a whole litany of phone calls from teachers when they were in primary school saying, you know, Mrs. Chang, your daughter didn't do her homework. She forgot her things. You know, she like left out a whole page of exam questions, you know, like that kind of stuff, which probably is familiar to you as well where you are. Um, and it can be tough. It can be tough because I think it's an expectation that people's executive yeah. function is the new term I learned, right? That people's executive function should be at a certain age, their, their biological age. But we also know from research that for those with ADHD, Sometimes they're a bit younger, um, so they don't really have those skills yet, but the expectation is there. So I think as we understand a little bit more about the wiring now, it's actually trying to be the advocate. You know, I think I didn't do enough of that when I was you know, at that age, when they were younger. And uh, some things I do regret, but there's some things I can try and change, if not for me, but for other people. 
Um, I think in schools now, the teachers are a little bit stressed uh, because I think there are certain behavioral um, aspects for ADHD, right? Like in the classroom. So teachers don't always know how to manage it. But um, there is more openness to, to learn. And that's when we've been getting requests to do workshops in schools as well. So just two months ago, I you know, uh, was speaking to the school counselors of some of the independent schools about um, ADHD. And in these schools, they were like, you know, quite high profile schools in terms of very rigorous standards. So the, the talk actually was about, you know, ADHD with high ability students. And they realized that for girls, there were also different considerations. So, you know, there's, there's so many ways to talk about ADHD and different populations. So I'm just glad to have more conversations about it. And that's so wonderful to be, you know, for you to take charge and for you to lead this conversation now. And you mentioned that, you know, you wish you could have done more then. And I'm sure your daughters feel that you have supported them enough, um, absolutely, um, to the moon and back. But just in terms of the expectations of what it's like um, as, a, as a mother with ADHD and, and within the school and the expectations of that, how, how did that play for you and um, to always have everything together for your kids? What was your personal experience with that? I, I think if you are an adult with ADHD, it's a double whammy if you're a parent too, right? Because you've not just got to organize your kids, but you've got to organize yourself, you know? And so we always struggle with the consistency issue, right? Um, but I think also, we also need to know where to pick our battles. And, and sometimes when you're in the midst of it, it's not always easy to know to like relax, you know, things will work out because it just sounds too easy to say. But, you know, having gone through some of these stages now, I think that there is some wisdom in that. So one of the things I learned, you know, in the last couple of years is things like, you know, when we tend to get anxious, and as you know, anxiety is one of the comorbidities. When we get anxious, uh, it's actually quite contagious. So, you know, we do transfer that to our kids. So part of it is actually catching ourselves when we start catastrophizing the future for them. And then trying to like step back and look at everything in context, right? Like what's the most important? Um, and, and one of the things I'm, I've been learning on this journey is really to work on the relationship because um, sometimes we get so caught up in strategies and you know, trying to chase the A's or the good schools that we forget about that. So that's one of the messages that Unlocking ADG is trying to do uh, when it comes to parents, you know, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a that particular challenge of being an ADHD parent <laughs> of an ADHD kid, like, and... It, you know, there can be a lot of, you know, one of the things we struggle with AD, with ADHD is like there's a group of people who just go, oh, it's bad parenting. Like that child just needs discipline. And, and as a parent, you're struggling as well. And like it, that kind of judgment is, is tough. Like it's really, really tough. And uh, it's a world that I think that was a really lovely insight on that focus on, on relationship. All right, I've got a broader question for you. Um, uh, what, what is the thing you'd most like people to know about ADHD? I think it's important to know that uh, there are a lot of strengths with ADHD and that people actually are trying. I think, you know, for most of the people I spoke with, myself included, we actually try pretty hard. It's just that it may not always be obvious. And I think that we need to give that encouragement because uh, many times, you know, instead of the encouragement, we actually are saying, why can't you do better? And... Uh, I think it affects us. So I, I think it's to be able to reframe how we look at uh, people with ADHD to know that you know, there are inherent strengths. You know, sometimes we need a little bit of guidance or support, but uh, we can do well. We can thrive. We can outperform. And it's to have that inherent belief, that, that, that positive outlook that actually helps us to, you know, someone said, you know, is to have those positive expectations and people actually do their best to meet that expectation. Um, so that's the way we're trying to like frame things, you know, on, on a more positive psychology basis. Yeah. Wonderful. And so as unlocking, unlock ADHD moves forward, um, what, what do you, what's the big agenda? What's next for you? And, and what would you like to come to conference saying next year in and around what's, um, you know, what's been the successes for this year ahead? Wow. That's a big question. <laughs> um, I think for us, it, I mean, the fun thing, but also the scary thing is you know, we can't even predict where we are six months from now. And it's not for lack of planning, but um, I think things sometimes move very fast for us. Um, like just a few months ago, we moved into our office. 
I had given up the hope of having a physical office for a long time. But you know, a wonderful benefactor, Singapore Pools, came into the picture and has given us rent-free office, right? So the next step, you know, now is I'm building my team. Because, you know, we do have opportunities to go and impact the community. But what I find is being needed right now is really people on the team to be able to do that. And to get people on the team, you know, we also need to be able to pay them. So, you know, I think fundraising and, and also team building is going to be my focus for the next half year, year. Um, so that we can create uh, those support systems and those tools that uh, would be helpful um, across the board uh, to the community. Look, the speed at which you're growing, uh, I'm looking at it, is, is incredible. If you look at, you know, it's a young charity, you know, got, already got that sort of prominence of Singaporean of the year, that sort of notice. I know you're a small big... country. We're a small country. You can always remember that. Okay. Like, um, it's still great. Like, and um, uh, the um, it's very modest uh, and lovely. And the the um, uh, and I know you've got some big hurdles to get through because I think as you talk to like different from other countries, for you to be able to get to that sort of established charity status, the government has to approve you. And that's why you mentioned earlier all about the sort of that stakeholder um, management issues, because what you're really, I think, talking about is that stakeholder is the government. They have to be on board and everyone has to be persuaded of your, your strength and your purpose and your abilities for them to allow that. And it's just uh, the, the speed at which you're doing that is, is wonderful and extraordinary. And I, I, can, I know how hard it is, I have an inkling of how hard it is. Um, Right, I have a personal favourite last question, so I'm being allowed to do it. So, um, uh, what is the the worst thing that's happened to you as a result of your ADHD, and what is the best thing? And if we can do best last and worst first, so that we end on a high note. Worst thing that happened to me, I. Well, wow, that's a very deep question, okay? But um, I think for me, I wouldn't exactly call it worst thing. I'm very lucky, okay? Because, you know, when we, I did an inventory of my strengths, one of my top five actually is positivity, okay? So maybe that's like the natural protection mechanism and insulator. Uh, so, I know, I've had a pretty uh, challenging couple of months um, in terms of, you know, dealing with um, interpersonal relationships and all that because... As you know, when you're working, you know, with community, there's going to be a lot of different kinds of um, experiences that people bring to the table, and you know, uh, people having emotional issues and all that. So I think it, it was tough for me because um, sometimes you assume that okay, very clearly a formula, right? You know, A plus B plus C, they should have a D outcome, and life is not so simple. Um, I've learned to question some of my assumptions. I've learned to look at the way I work and, and, and even what I say or tone or whatever and how it impacts on people. So that's been a very humbling experience, honestly, for me uh, and painful. But I also think that even as I learn, um, it also gives me an opportunity to do things better. So I, I always sort of see it as a, you know, I went for a talk yesterday about procrastination and the speaker talked about how when we're in our discomfort zone more, it actually builds up the resilience so that it actually equips us to do better, right, in life. So, you know, that, that is my so-called worst moments that I'm trying to make it into a, a good moment, right? Uh, like character building. Um, in terms of the best, best moments in life, I think the, the fact that, you know, what started out as a mom, right? You know, having a lot of pain, you know, with her daughter and herself and, and pain through my nose, okay, for all these kind of treatments and specialist stuff, um, thinking, okay, you know, let's, let's try and do some good, you know, and, and sort of like share more with people. Uh, this has gone beyond what I or originally planned or thought. Uh, so, so sometimes, you know, it's quite unbelievable. I've never been so tired. I've never been so stressed, you know, or, or so challenged before. But there's also so much joy uh, in, in having people reach out to me and say, thank you for doing this, um, you know, and, and keep it up. So, so, yeah, I'm just, you know, it's always up and down, up and down, but overall it's up. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to do what I'm doing now. You know, there's a Japanese term called Ikigai, um, you know, where you found that sweet spot, 
you know, into what you're passionate about, you know, what you do well and what people want to pay you for. I haven't got to pay yet, but, you know, the other part sort of checks the boxes. And I'm actually leaving for Okinawa tonight to learn more about Ikigai. So I think I found my purpose. And my purpose in life really is to uncover diamonds. And I believe that ADHD is inherently are precious. They are diamonds in the rough, you know, and what we're trying to do is really to put in that work to polish it, uncover it, so they can see the shiny bits inside, you know, and others can see it too. Oh, how wonderful. Oh my gosh, what a high to end on, Henry. I don't know about you, but um, you radiate positivity, Moon, and I thank you so much for sharing um, Unlocking ADHD, your story and your achievements, and then also to what's coming up next. We just can't wait to see what's happening. Um, so stay in touch. And again, thank you so much. And Henry, thank you so much for being here um, and uh, talking with Moon. Thank you both.